welcome. Um, I have the honor to tell you guys something about uh, advanced reproduction techniques. Um, my native language isn't English, but I'll try to do it as good as I can. And if I'm saying stuff that doesn't make sense, please let me know and I'll explain a little bit better. <laughs> um, so as I said, we're going to talk about advanced reproduction techniques. My name is Tineke de Haan. I work quite close to here, uh, about 15 minutes down the road. Um, and I work and uh, I'm an owner at Equilife Pardon Artsen. Um, so we're an all-round clinic. Um, so we do 24-7 emergencies, uh, x-rays, uh, anything you can think of really, I think. Um, but we have a, a clear specialty um, for reproduction. Um, and therefore we also do quite a bit of embryo transfer, uh, OPU, ICSI. Well, we do the ICSI somewhere else, but we'll elaborate on that later on. Um, the clinic uh, started five years ago, so we exist now for five years. Um, and at the moment we're with three veterinarians and three vet nurses. And in the season we're with four vets and four vet nurses, because we're busier in summertime than we are in wintertime, since we do a lot of reproduction. Um, if we want to come to where we are now today with the reproduction, uh, I'd like to start at the beginning. Um, so our horse started about 17 million years ago, we think. Um, the horse then weighed about 37 kilograms, so it was very tiny. It lived in swamps and forests. Um, as you can see, I figured out how the pointer worked, so that's good. Or at least I thought so. Huh. So uh, the toes were quite different. Huh? N nowadays the horses have one hoof. Um, but that all developed during the years um, over time. And now the hoof is as we know it today. And the horse has grown as well. Because, well, I think none of the horses we have are 37 kilos. N neither are the ponies. So um, there's documentation uh, that the Greeks started d domesticating the horses about 40, um, 3,500 years ago. Um, and we turned the horse into a functional animal for us to use. Um, not as we know today in sports, but more we used them during war, um, to pull the carriage, to drive people around. We used them in the coal mines, for example. Um, we used them to work on the field and pull more carriages, but then with stuff on it instead of people. Um, but then over the years, machines came and they took the jobs from the horses, basically. Um, and the horses found a new purpose and the horses we know today are mainly used for sports and recreation. Um, the fact that that has happened has um, caused that we start started having specific breeding types. You know, we didn't want just a muscled horse that could pull a carriage, but we wanted a athletic horse that could jump well, or a dressage horse that moves well, or <laughs> pony. I don't know if we all know this pony, but I quite like him. Um, you can Google, Google him, he's called Ed. Um, anyway, so now we have specific uh, breeds with specific goals that we want the horses to do. So that created stud bugs, because then we could put the horses in like a... Uh, well, all together uh, with, with a specific um, uh, usage, basically. Um, but that also caused that we wanted more offspring from one stallion at the same time. Um, because we, if we have a really good jumping stallion, we all want to use that stallion for our jumping mare. So what happened um, is that the one stallion covered quite a few mares during one day. Uh, sometimes he had to cover two mares, which was quite okay. Sometimes, at some point, he had to cover eight mares, which was a bit much, and you can think, uh, if you're the last mare that day, probably the semen is not very good. So then that turned into AI, I think we all know that. Uh, we collect the semen from the stallion, we divide it over different portions, and we inseminate the mares down the road, or even ship it to different countries. So that's sort of the reproduction as it's been for quite a while. But over the last few years, um, there are a new, few new things uh, have come to the scene, uh, such as embryo flush and transfer. Um, the OPU ICSI is more and more established, I think, in the um, 
also commercially. Um, and then we have, I want to talk a little bit about freezing embryos and um, mean specifically freezing fresh embryos and not necessarily the ICSI embryos because they basically almost all get frozen. Um, but we'll come to that later. So, um, embryo flush and embryo transfer. Let me ask how many people have seen an embryo flush or transfer before? Okay, so that's about half and half. Well, I've got quite a few pictures for the people that haven't seen it to, to show how it's done and, and what, yeah, what you can see. Um, so why would we do an embryo flush? Um, the mare is physically not capable to carry her own pregnancy. Sometimes they get too old or even at an earlier stage their feet aren't good enough or their backs can't pull it or um, well, th there's different reasons that the mare cannot uh, carry her own pregnancy. Um, the mare could be used in sports and therefore we don't want to carry her own pregnancy so she can continue her sports career. Sometimes people think or they actually have a really good mare and they want more than one fall from it that year so they can have more offspring. Um, and sort of at the same time the, they want to sell an embryo um, and therefore they want more embryos, one for themselves and one for uh, the person who bought the embryo. Well. Uh, an embryo flush, when do we do that? So the mare gets inseminated herself, so we follow the cycle, we scan her, we think, okay, she's ready to be inseminated. The mare gets inseminated and we scan her every day. So um, in the case of fresh semen, we scan her once daily. Then when we've established the ovulation, so let's say today's Friday, this morning she had ovulated, yesterday she had not, so today is day zero. Then next week's Saturday is day eight, so that is the day we will flush her. Um, you can sometimes do day seven, sometimes do day nine. That can depend a little bit on the age of the mare. When the mares get older, um, and then I'm talking about like 20 years of age, you can maybe wait another day because the embryos develop a little bit slower. Um, if it's, I, I have some colleagues and they say, oh, it's a Sunday and it's a very young mare, I'll flush them a day earlier so I can flush them on Saturday. And there's, it's not really a problem, to be honest. Um, frozen semen tends to develop the embryos a little bit slower, so then maybe you can wait a little bit longer, especially when your mare that you're using is also older. So, you know, I, I would say 95 of the t percent of the time we flush on day eight, um, but there are some ex exceptions. So then possibly we get an embryo. You don't always get an embryo because the mare doesn't always get pregnant. Sort of makes sense, but it's good to keep that in mind. Uh, when you start doing the procedure, otherwise you might be a little bit disappointed. So there's no guarantee. So you either have zero embryos, and it can go up to three embryos. Um, three embryos is very rare. I've had it twice in my career so far, but it is possible. Um, so then we flush the embryo, and we'll assess the embryo under the microscope, because hopefully when you have your little dish, you can already see it, because, you know, that's a, that's a good thing. You think, oh, yeah, I've got the embryo. Uh, but it's relatively small and to assess the quality of the embryo you'll have to look under the microscope to see what it's like. Then we'll wash the embryo which I'll talk a little bit more about later because um, if you've never seen it I can imagine you think yeah washing what does that contain do we have to scrub it or do we use some soap or what do we do but um, I'll show that uh, in a few slides. Then we'll we at the clinic usually transfer straight away into a recipient um, Back in the days when we didn't have so many recipients, I think we've got about 400 at the moment, but in the beginning we didn't have so many, so sometimes they did not synchronize well with the donor, and then we had other clinics down the road that had also recipients, and then we used to ship them to them. But normally, these days, we always transfer them straight away, which is better, I think. Uh, the, less, the less you handle the embryo, the bigger the chance they'll get pregnant into the recipient. So here's some numbers that says minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. So what does that mean? When we transfer the embryo into a recipient, we need the recipient mare to be in somewhat the same point in the cycle as the donor mare, because the uterus has to be in sync sort of thing. So when we say zero, that means the donor mare we flushed was on day eight, and that means that the recipient is also on day eight of the cycle. And when we say minus one, that means the um, recipient mare is basically one day ahead, so she's day nine. And um, when we say plus one, plus two, the recipient mare is one or two days behind, so she's plus six or plus seven, basically. So six or seven days after ovulation. 
Um, in my experience and also in research experience, plus one, plus two is probably your best day to go. So if the recipient is one or two days behind the donor mare, that's probably the best, but that's not always the case. So then day zero or even plus three, so that the recipient is five days after ovulation, um, is also still fine. Minus one is okay. I would not necessarily try to have recipients that are only four days after ovulation. Sometimes we have to, if it, if the recipient is owned by uh, by the owner who also has the donor mare and only has one recipient, and that mare turns out day four because it didn't work out that way, or it didn't work out better, let's put it that way, then, um, then sometimes you have no choice, really. And then you try. And still usually works when the mare is younger, but I wouldn't try to go for day four if I have to. Um, then, if, if we have flushed the donor mare, we usually PG them unless the owner really doesn't want to. Um, it's for several reasons. You PG them because then they come into season more quickly. Um, when you flush the donor mare, uh, she's not in season, obviously, because she's eight days after ovulation, um, which means the resistance in the uterus for bacteria and stuff is at a low point. So you're manipulating a uterus where you shouldn't really be into, to be honest. Um, so if she comes into season, if you did somehow um, cause some bacteria to enter the uterus, she can clean herself up. Um, and also, sometimes, very, very sometimes, but it does happen, the embryo can still be in the fallopian tube when you flush on day eight. And you only flush the uterus. So it does happen that when the embryo is still in the fallopian tube and you flushed her and the embryo enters the uh, uterus one or two days after you flushed her, she can still be pregnant. And it's usually not why we flushed her in the first place. So if you PG her, you cause her not to be pregnant herself in case you know, the small chance that it was in the fallopian tube. So this is a, is a, a drawing of what happens. Um, here we see the uterus, hang in here. Underneath here is the bladder, but we uh, don't touch that. Then here is a little balloon that's attached to this tube, or it's basically in the tube. So when we flush the mare, we um, bring this little catheter into the uterus, through the cervix and then we blow up the balloon, which causes the catheter not to come back out of the horse. So um, then we have this bag. We use uh, ringers. Um, some you can also have commercial bags. They're usually quite a bit more expensive and ringers works just as well. Um, so that's what we do. Um, so the fluid goes into the horse this way, blows up the uterus, then we let it come back out, because then this is closed off and this is going in. Then we close this off and let the fluid come back out. It goes through a filter. Well, and here's this little conical thing. We have a bucket, which also does the job. <laughs> um, and then we do about three times. So we blow the uterus up, let it come back out, blow the uterus up again, let it come back out. And with the fluid coming out, the embryo will come out with it. That's the idea. So what do we do with the mare when we flush her? Sometimes we sedate the mare, usually we don't. Um, if we don't have to, we don't do it, because it's just another extra thing that's not necessary. Um, we tie up the tail, wash the uh, vulva, very good. Um, then we place the catheter, as I said, into the uterus, and we have this bag of five liters lactated ringers. Let the fluid go in, let the fluid come out, and we do that about three times. Sometimes a young mare, a three-year-old, can only have one liter in the uterus, and she's full. You'll notice, because she'll go like, mm, that's uncomfortable, yeah, like, okay. Then a liter is enough, and you let it come back out. Uh, sometimes when you have an older mare that has still a fall on foot, you can, I flush her sometimes twice, because then with two and a half liters, I can blow up the uterus very good. And I'd rather have that than three times a little bit of blowing up sort of thing. Then, uh, this is a picture of our laminar flow. You don't have to have a laminar flow as long as you have a microscope. You can see the microscope here. We have a, a building heating table a heating table so the embryo will never cool down too much, which embryos don't like. They like to stay in a stable temperature, stable environment. Um, if you don't have a warming table, uh, usually, like if you have a loose microscope, most vets have a little side table that you can put the embryos onto when you're not looking at them. Um, then if I'm not paying attention and it's bring your kid to work day, I have the best help I can get. <laughs> um, 
but anyway. So here we have this uh, little dish. Um, you can see it's got four wells. Here's one of the old tables that we used to use when we did not have the laminar flow yet. Um, you can put it at any temperature you like. Um, and basically you put fluid in all four of the wells. Um, and the transfer fluid we use, so the fluid that the embryo is in when you transfer the embryo, is not lactated ringers. We use a uh, commercial vial for that. Um, and we want to have washed off all the ringers. So we start with ringers in here, we end up with the fluid 100% in here for the transfer, and we wash, her, wash the embryo through four, um, four of the wells. Then the embryo quality is assessed under the microscope. We uh, usually all, I think in the whole world, use grade one to four. Um, I won't bore you with the, with the details really, but this is a nice looking embryo. It's nice and round. Um, it's not weird looking. When you see the other ones, you'll know why this one's quite nice. This is from a book, because I didn't really have my own pictures of nasty looking embryos. But you can see that this is not as nice as that one. Then we have a grade three, which has multiple spot of degeneration. And then we have a grade four, which we can, I think all imagine is pretty ugly. And it's probably not gonna live when you transfer it. But no matter how ugly the embryos are, we'll always transfer them because the one out of 100 might catch on and then at least we have that one. Then I've got a few more pictures of very nice embryos because I just love looking at embryos. They're so pretty and they're perfect. Um, and I'll share my enthusiasm. <laughs> But you can see, it, like the zona pellucida is still here. You can see this little, little thicker area, basically. This is what's gonna be the actual embryo. Um, and everything else is probably gonna be placenta and, and all that other stuff. Um, and I've got another one that's also pretty. You can see here the thickening really a little bit, which is gonna be the embryo. Sometimes we have twins, then we're very happy. Um, Sometimes when the mare gets pregnant herself, we have twins. We're not so happy. Um, we aren't, anyway. Um, we always crush one, but when you have an, uh, an embryo flush, you're quite happy with twins, because then you can transfer both of the embryos in two different mares, and you can have two pregnancies. Sometimes we have triplets. This is one of the pictures from two years ago. Um, this one doesn't look as pretty. You can still see... Um, uh, the outer lining really that looks still intact but this is well it's probably not intact because the inside lining has shriveled um, so basically fluid has entered and therefore this is collapsing a little bit but nature has it that two of these three embryos got pregnant and I'll let you know that it was this one that not got pregnant did not get pregnant so that's always a surprise so this one made it this one didn't then this is a picture of the, the yeah, transfer pipe, basically. So here are a few little straws. So how we transfer the embryo, we draw up some fluid in that straw with the embryo. So then fluid plus embryo is in the straw. And what we want to do is sort of inseminate the recipient mare with that fluid and baby. Um, I'll show you how that works. We put this little straw where the embryo is already into in this uh, tubing here. And this is metal, and that will go over the straw into the blue tubing. And this is pulled out, and you only push it in once you're in the recipient. Otherwise, you will push the embryo into plastic, which is probably not a very good idea. Um, this is what it looks like then. So this is basically what you have when you walk up to the horse and you squirt it in once you're there. So when I go to the recipient, the recipient's all nice and clean, I put this thing through the cervix manually. Uh, once I know I'm through the cervix, I take my hand out and put it in rectally. And through the rectum, you can feel the uterus very well. You don't necessarily need to put the baby all the way up to the left horn or all the way up to the right horn. Um, you kind of don't really want to do that because you can imagine, because this is metal, it's quite rigid. So if you have to move all the way down to the left or right horn, it's just gonna cause damage and irritation. So as long as I'm comfortable and it's in the middle of the uterus, I'm sure it's in the right place. Um, that's where we put it. Then there's some results from, uh, from our clinic. Um, this is from last year. We did 378 flushes, 87, sorry, it's always Dutch-English mix up. But anyway, we did 387 flushes. We recovered 204 embryos, which is about 53%, which is a little bit low, to be honest, is, is less than different years. It happens. One year goes better than the other year, and you're not always sure why. Um, 
but it is what it is and next year will hopefully probably be better. Um, we're twins in eight, eight and a half percent of the cases that we had an embryo was a twin. Um, the overall pregnancy rate after transfer was 86%, which is quite okay. Um, and then we did another mathematical uh, thingy and we looked at the pregnancy rate when we did the follow-up of the mares ourselves. So when we guided the recipient ourselves and looked, is this a, a suitable recipient or not? Um, and then the result, the pregnancy rates were actually 92%. I'm not showing this because I want to pat myself on the shoulder and say, oh, look, we did a good job, which I'm quite happy we did. But it's more that uh, to point out that uh, it's not just something uh, we all can do and think, oh, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's a, a specific procedure that needs to be done by someone who actually wants to do it well and has the, the motivation to do it right. And therefore, if you ever want to do it yourself, pick, um, pick wisely who you, who you let do it. Anyway, you know what I mean. Um, then we uh, have the, the costs. Then, um, so I, I use the costs from our clinic because I don't necessarily know what other clinics charge, but um, um, then at least you have some idea of, uh, of the costs. We scan the horses all year round for 190 euros. Um, this is all excluding vet, um, which is rather cheap, I know that, but um, yeah, it works for us. We all have the horse at the clinic, so therefore we can, we don't have to drive around a whole lot to places, so therefore we can do it a little bit cheaper. Uh, the embryo flush was 285, the embryo transfer would cost 240, that's per flush, per transfer. Um, other med medic, uh, medications and treatments, I put down 100 euros, but it's so different. One mare doesn't need any extra help, the other mare needs a lot of flushing afterwards, and then it can go up to a few hundred euros, but just for the, you know, to have an idea, I, I put it at a hundred bucks. Um, so in case you have a success at first try, so one flush, one, one transfer, um, you have about 850 euros veterinary costs. But let's say you have to flush a mare three times before you finally have the embryo and to get the recipient pregnant, uh, you end up uh, with 1385 euros. Um, I did this because I'll also show you the cost of ICSI and we can sort of compare them what, what happens. Um, so then I want to talk a little bit about the OPU and the ICSI. Um, anyone that has done OPU with their horses? Okay, so that's less. Um, um, then I can have some nice pictures to show you what we do. So OPU means ovum pick up. So basically what you do, you go into the horse um, and retrieve the oocyte straight out of the ovary and then do uh, vertilization in the lab, so IVF. Um, recovery about 60% means that uh, when you look at ovaries, normally they have all these black follicles, you know, the black blobs. Um, so we puncture the blob um, and about 60% of the time on average, um, according to literature, you retrieve the oocyte out of the um, follicle. With humans and cows, I know it's quite a lot easier. Um, they just puncture it, suck the fluid out, and they basically always have the oocyte. With horses, of course, it has to be a little bit difficult um, because it's always different for some reason. Um, and oocytes in horse follicles are more stuck. So we have to scrape the follicle with the needle as well to get, the, get it out. And we blow up the follicle about 10 times, suck it empty, blow it up, suck it empty. I'll have a video of that later. What we do is we puncture immature follicles, so we don't do any hormonal stimulation to the horse. We just scan them, and when we think, okay, this is a good point in time, she's got quite a few nice follicles, that's the point in time where we, when we uh, will puncture the horse. Um, we'd like to, be, uh, like to have the follicles a little bit over 0 0.8 centimeters, so not too small. Um, also not too big, because it takes a lot of time, and usually they don't turn into embryos anyway. Then the ICSI is followed after that. So ICSI means intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So basically you inject one sperm cell into the one oocyte. So what do we do? Uh, very briefly, the mare gets in the stocks, she gets sedated, gets some painkillers, gets one shot of antibiotics and intestinal relaxant because you're in the rectum with your hand. Um, so you want everything to be relaxed so you don't cause any damage. Um, we usually send our oocytes to Italy, uh, to Avantea. There, 
the first center in the world that started doing it bigger commercially and they're still leading in the world and since in Holland we're relatively relatively close to Italy so it's it's nice that we can collaborate with them in that way um, but if they're if the oocytes are shipped it means it's export and for us in Holland that means we have to test the mares for CEM and EIA before we can ship the oocytes um, then when we've done the OPU we usually give the mares a few days break before we work them again why would we do the OPU or ICSI? So again, if you have a less fertile mare or infertile, infertile mare, um, I didn't translate that, but it means uh, that you can do embryo, normal embryo transfer, then you can still do uh, ICSI possibly. Again, if the mare is in sports, you can do this. Um, sometimes the mare all of a sudden collapses, gets sick, gets colic, um, and people still want offspring, and then they think, oh, what can we do? Then you could do ICSI. Um, if there's not enough semen present, like if there's only from a certain stallion that you want to use a small amount of semen left, then usually the person who owns the semen does not want you to put a few straws in a horse for one normal pregnancy. Um, so then ICSI can be a, an outcome for that. Sometimes semen is just not good enough quality-wise to, uh, to use for normal fertilization. So then you could do ICSI as well. I put it in between brackets because in Holland we're not allowed to clone, so we don't do it, but sometimes you, you need oocytes if you want to do cloning in different countries. Um, that is accepted. Then, cost-wise, um, the OPU itself is around 900 euros, medication about 150, the transport cost is 300, and VWA, that's our national authority that, that checks all your shipments if they're not, um, uh, yeah, if it's all safe. Um, but it needs to be paid, because we need to pay them. <laughs> then the maturation cost is something that Italy um, uh, bills us for, so we bill the client, it's 180 euros. Um, and then the itself, so the injection is 500 euros. And then if you want to use a second stallion, for, for example, if you have a lot of oocytes during one OP, you can say, okay, I'll try two different stallions. Um, the extra cost of that are 320 and then what Avantea does is every embryo they produce they charge for as well which is 550 so basically the cost you'll you'll have all the time even with no embryos are 2150 euros and then 550 uh, 550 euro per embryo gets put on top of that so for example if you have one embryo the costs are about 2700 euros um, if you have four embryos, you have 4,350 euros in total. And then if you divide that by four, the costs are about a good thousand euros per embryo. So basically, the more embryos per session, the cheaper it gets per embryo, which makes sense, but it shows in. So this is our setting. We're with uh, three people doing it always. That's me. I'm in the horse. I'm rectally. Then here's my colleague. She has our probe holder in the vagina. Um, and there's our lovely assistant, and she has a syringe in her hand. So we're here looking at the ultrasound, and the ultrasound probe is in the probe holder that goes into the vagina. Also, the needle that we puncture with also goes through that same probe holder, um, and therefore we can always see the needle coming, uh, coming out when we puncture uh, an ovary. Um, I'm in rectally because I'm holding the, o the whole ovary and I put it against the vaginal wall because you don't want to sort of move with your needle through the intestine. You want to have that uh, the ovary on one side of the vaginal wall, probe a needle on the other side and you puncture straight into it. So if you look over our shoulders then you see the scanner and we, we have a clear vision of the ovary. I'll, I'll have a better video later on but you can see the ov ovary here. Um, so this is the probe holder on the inside. Here's um, the probe that's in this little plastic block. And you can see the bubble here coming out. I don't think you can see it very well, but I can point it out, thankfully. Here's a little guide, uh, a little hole where the needle goes through. So it's always in the same place, always under the same angle. We can see the needle coming out of the probe holder on our ultrasound screen. So then we close it up. This is what it looks like. And this is what gets put into the vagina of the mare. Then this is the syringe that my uh, lovely assistant is always holding. Um, when the follicle is big, we need to blow it up with more volume. So I usually say, okay, Daniela, it's going to be two millimeter, milliliters. And then she can see what she's doing. And I count, I say yes, she counts one. I say yes again, she counts two and pushes in. And then we go up to 10. 
Um, this is a little picture that, that shows why you need to scrape the follicle wall in horses, because you can see, um, for example, with cows, it's sort of the oocyte is a lot more loose, and therefore it, you pull it out quite quickly. Um, this is quite attached to the uterine wall, and therefore when a needle comes along, it'll scrape this, and it'll sort of scrape the oocyte off the wall of the follicle. Um, thankfully, there's no sensory nerves inside the ovary, so the mare doesn't really feel that, so that's good. Then here we have a little uh, video, I think. Yeah, there we go. Um, so you see the needle coming out there, goes into this follicle, and you can see it doing twists. So we tried to do 180s, 180s the whole time. So we blow it up again. You can see it blow up, and then it sucks it empty again. It's on the pump that collects the fluid when it comes out the hole. So you can also see that I'm sort of moving the O size because you want to uh, uh, the o sorry because you want to push the whole wall of the follicle all around your needle so you're sure or as sure as you can to get a follicle out or the O side out. I have another little video. It's basically the same thing. This one is a little bit smaller. You can also see then it collapses quicker and it blows up faster. Um, it's nice to do when they're smaller because you're quicker and faster, but at the same time we know that when the follicles are smaller than one centimeter, the oocyte out of that follicle is less likely to become an embryo. So the, nice, the, the small ones look very nice and efficient, but in the end they're not necessarily. Um, here are a few photos of, um, of oocytes when they come out. So all o oocytes are the same size, which might not look like uh, they are, but they are, because you can see the the little black insides, the dark insides, and they sort of have this halo around them. That's the actual oocyte. And these cloudy bits that you see everywhere are um, cumula cells. And there, that's the cells you saw around the oocytes as well in the picture. And that's what you scraped off with the, with the oocyte, which is fine. That's, it's actually good if you have, a, uh, like this one, an oocyte that's completely without cumula cells. Um, it's less good because they also feed the oocyte a little bit, the cumula cells. Then we have the ICSI itself, which is the second step in the procedure, so the injection of the sperm into the oocyte. So it's sort of a special form of IVF, um, the normal form, so, so putting oocytes and sperm in a dish and let nature do the rest does not really work in horses. Um, there are some research team the teams that are having some sort of success, but commercially it's definitely not possible yet. You need a, a quite expensive setup. Um, what you see here is a microscope with uh, micro manipulators on each side. So basically these little joysticks steer the micro manipulators. This is one, this is the other one. And they have little sticks here which you can attach a needle um, to on both sides. And therefore you have two needles on each side and they work very, uh, you can make very small movements and therefore work very um, precisely which you need to do. Like anyone can imagine that you cannot do it by hand, hold a, an oocyte and a sperm cell and then inject it. So you need equipment for that. So under your microscope, it looks like this. Usually on one side you have um, uh, not necessarily a needle, but at least something that holds the, o the oocyte. There's the oocyte in place. You still see some cumula cells. And you can see uh, a needle here, and that needle will inject a sperm cell into the oocyte. I have a little video of that that we made. Uh, yeah, there it starts. It's going to zoom in at some point. They're so pretty, aren't they? <laughs> so if you look very closely at some point, ah, there he comes. There's the little sperm cell. Gets injected into the oocyte. Then you suck up a little bit of the cytoplasm, um, mainly just to be sure you're 100% sure you're through all the walls into the cytoplasm, so you're 100% sure you're injecting the sperm cell into the oocyte and not half into the wall or something. Yeah, and then you give it a little push and try to close your um, hole, and that's how it's done. And then you put it in culture, into little dishes, into little ovens, and then you hope for embryos. So what can you expect result-wise? I again used our own results for that from last season and this season. We mainly do it in winter time, so we're halfway our current season. So I also added the numbers from last season to um, uh, make it a bit more precise. Um, but the average amount of uh, follicles that we puncture per session are about 18.8 uh, yeah, follicles. And then we recover about 12.6 
all sites out of that. So our recovery is on average uh, 67%. So every follicle that we puncture, 67% of the time we get the oocyte out. Um, and then the average amount of embryos per session that we've created in combination with Avantea is 2.2 embryos, which is a little bit disappointing. If you compare it to cows and humans, uh, we're not doing that great of a job, but it's just not as easy as it is. Um, so when we, when we do an OPU and we get the result of three or four embryos per session, we're really happy. Then I've put it in a little bit of a graph and a diagram. Um, so it shows the picture because on average it's 2.2. But what we can see here, this is the amount of embryos that we have per session, that in 19% of the cases we have zero embryos. Then we have about in 28% of the case, we've got one embryo in two uh, two embryos in 19% of the cases, three embryos in 11% of the cases, and uh, four embryos in 10% and goes up and up. Um, very sometimes we have six, seven, eight, once we've had 10, once we've had 11 in the last year, um, which is of course a lot. So then we need to, uh, when the embryos are created, uh, we do it in winter time, so they're basically always frozen uh, in nitrogen, just like the semen is, uh, and we thaw them when, when the recipient mare is, um, is ready to put it into. So the recipient uh, is four days after ovulation, always. Um, so if she ovulated on Monday, we'll put the embryo in on Friday. Uh, we scan therefore the recipient every day, so we're sure that that day is the right day. Um, sometimes we have a referral or like other vets have scanned them at home and said, oh yeah, I scanned her on Wednesday and then scanned her on Friday again, but I could clearly see that she had just ovulated. Um, even if I'd scanned her myself in, in that way, I would not transfer the embryo because it's too costly um, to sort of mess around that way, I think. Um, yeah, therefore, because the embryo is frozen, you don't need to synchronize your horses. So the donor mare and recipient mare don't need to be synchronized. And therefore, it's actually easier to use your own recipient for that, if you have one. Um, because there's different freezing techniques, there's also different thawing techniques. Um, I won't bore you with it, but if you want to know, you can always send me an email or a text or whatever. Um, we call it slow freezing and vitrification. So slow freezing, the embryo becomes colder and colder over about the period of an hour. Um, vitrification, it basically gets dunked into the nitrogen and then is frozen. So these are two pictures after f uh, thawing of the embryos. It's, the pictures are not as nice, but it's because they're that small and the cameras are therefore not good enough to make a very nice photo of it, but they're, they're a lot smaller than a fresh embryo. Here's a comparison. Here you can see a fresh embryo. Here you can see the uh, baby embryo after an ICSI session. What can we expect from the ICSI embryos after transfer? Because they've been frozen, it's a different technique. You can expect different results, you think. So for us, last year or last season, last summer, what we did, the overall pregnancy rate was uh, 67%. 76, sorry, do it again. <laughs> um, but then again, I made the comparison by mares that we followed up ourselves and mares that got scanned at home or wherever and sent to us to put the embryo in. And you can see a difference again that when we scanned them ourselves, it was 81% if they did it at home or wherever, it was 64%. And again, it's not to pat ourselves on the back, but it's more to point out that if you're willing to do it, get it done by someone who's experienced and, and um, advanced with the technique. Um, I think uh, I, I need to point it out briefly. Um, we can talk about it for hours, I think, but more and more um, there's also ethical concerns, I think, what, what I hear. Uh, nowadays we live in a, in a world where everybody needs to uh, put everything on the internet and you can see everything on Facebook or on wherever. Um, so thankfully there is research done on how mares uh, respond to the uh, um, to the OPU, um, and for example, a, a few things to point out is that they did have an elevated heart rate during the procedure, um, but the cortisol, so your stress hormone in saliva was not changed, the, the breath rate was not changed, some blood vo values were measured, um, they did shift a little bit during, after the procedure, but they were still within normal limits. And I think it's normal to expect some difference because you're not doing nothing. Like, I think we have to be honest, like you're, you're doing a, a procedure on the horse and you, 
are sticking a needle through the horse's vagina into her um, uh, her ovary. Um, but in my experience, most mares are really comfortable during the procedure, and if they're not, and if they're too uncomfortable, we'll stop. We then then we stop doing it. Um, the research also showed that older mares are overall a little bit more comfortable. Usually those older mares are also older breeding mares and they've had more falls. Because they've had more falls, the ovaries are a little bit more loose and you get less traction when you move it to the, the vaginal wall. Which makes, in my experience, that's, that's what they're troubled by the most, like the pulling on the ovary, not necessarily the sticking with the needle. They usually don't even really respond to that. Um, so I just want to say, and uh, as a vet, we need to use our brains. I'm not saying we shouldn't do this because it's a painful technique or whatever, but you do need to be responsible and when it's not going well or if the mare is too uncomfortable, you don't do it and you also advise the people to not do it again. But I've done it on quite a few occasions and then I'm talking to a, uh, a colleague of mine that works 200 kilometers down south. He says, oh yeah, I, I heard about this owner and um, he did OPU with you. I said, yeah, I, I did. And I told him I wasn't going to do it again because the mare was too uncomfortable. And that's sort of what happens. Then they just go to a different clinic and do it there. It also, like some people actually take your word for it and, and take your advice. But some people also don't. But then I can't really do anything about it at that point in time. Um, so again, choose your vet or the center where you're going to do it uh, wisely, if you ever do it. Then two minutes about freezing of fresh flushed embryos. Um, the freezing of the ICSI embryos is easier because they're a lot smaller. We've saw, seen the pictures, uh, the difference in size between the embryos. Um, the problem with the fresh flushed embryos is that they're usually quite big. Um, and we all know that when we have water that turns into ice, it expands. Um, and the same happens with embryos. Embryos are fluid filled, so when you freeze them, the fluid will expand and the embryo will collapse. Or not collapse, will um, explode, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so what we need to do when they're big, we need to dehydrate the embryo. Um, and I will show you how that's done. When they're smaller than 300 micrometers, it's fine, you can freeze them normally. Um, if they're bigger, you need to suck fluid out. So this is what that looks like. I'm not sure if this is a, yeah, this is a video. Um, we, d when we weren't able in this try to actually puncture the wall, but it's just nice to see how the embryo rotates and that it's not a, a rigid something. It, it's flexible, um, it's fluid filled. It's sort of like a balloon really. Um, but at some point we did get in, thankfully. And then, so you're in with your needle, you suck some fluid out, and then it looks like that. And it looks pretty shitty, to be honest. But once you thought it after, it looks really well again. And after transfer, you still have about 80 to 90% pregnancy rate. Nature is quite amazing, isn't it? And this is kind of what I wanted to tell you today. Um, if you have any questions, please ask me. If you have any questions after today or you want me to ask later on, here's my number or my email address. <laughs> and feel free to use it. <laughs>